Good morning. And there's a response. It's a great day in Iowa. You know what I really liked about this morning the most? I ended up parking between the lines out in the parking lot. No matter where I parked, it was right. And that's a great feeling. You know, it normally takes two or three returns forward back, not today. So I'm thrilled about that. I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you a little bit about this book. It's a, a deeply personal uh, talk because I'll show you in a minute why it is. But what I wanted to do was talk a little bit uh, about the value of stories. Uh, Andy Hermanson got up here and said, stories matter. This one does to me, and I hope you get something out of it as well. Uh, I got a little rust. I haven't talked to a group this big in over 10 years, so I'm not shaking. It doesn't bother me, but I got a lot of rust, and we'll see if we can knock some of it off. All right, I got to be able to run some stuff here. This is the epitome of John Wooden's work. He created this over a period of years, and I had the benefit of hearing him talk about this at an important point, point in my life. So it resonated with me. And I don't know why I got picked to be up here, but somehow it's all coming together. This little pyramid came to me at a point in my life I really needed it. And I'll show you how and why here in a minute. But first, what I want to do is give you a picture of the guy in his working environment. Now we're going back in time and he had a question that I'm going to ask you when he started each practice every year. You ready? Did you put your socks on right today? Did you put your socks on right today? And that's how he started every year, the practices that he started every year with his players. Now, if you were a four-year player, you heard this story every year. And he not only talked about it, he demonstrated it. I didn't know there was a wrong way to put your socks on. Did you? He did. He did it, and he showed you, in a me showed me in a meeting, how to do it. And I'm going, you know, I'm at the time 32 years old, and I'm going, what? What? How would you like to be 18 years old and have somebody explain to you how to put your socks on? Have you had anybody tell you how to do it the right way and reinforce it? And then he went to your shoes, how to put your shoes on correctly and how to lace your shoes properly. That's how he started every year with his team. And I thought about that and I'm thinking, how in the world would you keep and maintain anybody's interest for ungoshly amount of time? Maybe 15, 20 minutes he went through that or half an hour? Why would you do that? What's the value of that? It's in this particular picture of the pyramid. He's building the base. And he's building it in block by block form from the ground up. He's building you as a character from the ground up. And I'm going, oh, it, it's hard to believe. But what he wanted you to do, he wanted you to do the little things correctly every day. The little things in your life correctly every day. And if you can do that, then you can have success. And I'm going, whoa. Whoa. Yeah, I'm, why is that? You know, his teams uh, were unbelievably gifted, but what was really impressive was the way they practiced. 
and more importantly, the way they took the court before a game. They were methodical. They ran through their warm-ups in a scripted fashion, not a wasted step, not a wasted pass, not a wasted, not wasting time interacting with one another, but working in practice and working in the warm-ups before the game. And I got to watch this, uh, uh, and I'm going to take you back in circa to 1965, because that was my first interaction with this. Uh, I watched his team on, in the finals of the NCAAs, and, and at that time we had a black and white TV, and it, it produced more snow than picture. You remember those? You know, that's what it was in 65. I'm going to take you through 1965. I had a boyhood hero back in 1965, and this is him. Any of you know who that is? You're not from Michigan, I understand. Somebody does know. This was my boyhood hero. This guy could do it all. And I was a forward at the time on a seventh grade basketball team. You know, I was, uh, I, I played forward and, and this guy played forward. I got me a, uh, you know, this is back in the day of what I call the letter jackets. Remember the letter jackets? You don't see those anymore. You know, and I was doing a little research. I got me a letter. St. <laughs> Paul's Lutheran School. Basketball on there. Remember these things? Letters? That's what was going on back then. Look at, the, look at this picture. And uh, the shorts, you know, the... This guy was grace in motion, and that's what I wanted to be. You know, I played forward, as I said, I played forward, and my uh, nickname was Two Sheets. You know, if this guy could jump and do things athletically that only I aspired to. And the reason my name was Two Sheets was it was the amount of lift that I got between the floor and the bottom of my shoes. That's two sheets of 20 bond paper, so it's about that big. And that was it. But I could control the backboards, because when I got to the spot I needed to, no one moved me out of there. Can you believe that? I love basketball, and I love this guy. And Coach Wooden's team destroyed this guy. In the finals, they did something that I had never seen before through that little white snow, and that was they incorporated a three-quarter court zone press. They let you throw the ball in, and the minute they did, all heck broke loose. And they continued to get layup after layup after layup. A little guy by the name of Gail Goodrich was their... Uh, guard at the time, and I think he scored 41 points that game. We lost 91 to 80, and I was crushed. Unbelievably crushed. It, it was, I had never seen my guy go down in a heap like that, and it made him look bad. You know, now I'm going to come back to something about uh, this guy here in a minute. And the reason I'm going with notes is because I'll probably lose my way along the way. Coach Wooden understood the value of team play. Now, back, back in the day of uh, 1965, I worked on the farm and we had, I had the luxury of having four pairs of shoes. And the reason I had four pairs is because I played basketball. You know, one of those pair of shoes was what he's wearing. They're called Converse All-Stars. Oh, if you had Converse All-Stars, you had it going on. You know, the first thing 
that you had uh, as, as a kid back in those days was a pair of PF flyers. Remember those? You have them too? Most people did. Those were the go-to pair. I had a uh, second pair again because I was playing basketball and you didn't wear those outside the gym. You didn't do that. Those were preserved for on the court activity. Now the third pair of shoes I had, I have a lot of fond memories of. Uh, being on the farm, I had a, a the luck, I was the oldest child, so I got new shoes when my feet grew. And when we went to Rao Brothers General Store, we bought something called Red Wing Shoes. Those old Red Wing high tops, you know, the ones that you could, that with the hooks on, and you take them and you could lace them quick, you know, because you didn't wear them in the house. You took them off. So, you know, you, you could get them on and whoop, 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 zip, and you're done. You're up in the house, you take them off when you get in the house. Unfortunately, you know, when they were new, they were the greatest thing in the world because when they come out of the box, you'd smell them, and they smelled so good. I mean, they're brand new shoes, and they made you feel good. You know, that smell was unbelievable. You took them home, and you put bear grease on them to soften them up, and within two days, they looked like this. Everybody had a pair of these. Now, in the area that I grew up in, these were known as clodhoppers. And that was if you're on the farm, you're jumping, you're jumping the furrows, and you're going to end up with a pair of shoes that look like that. And I had a fourth pair of shoes. Now, anybody know what they were? Come on now. Sunday shoes. <laughs> they were right. Church shoes. Sunday shoes. That's what, they were. That's what we called them. Sunday shoes, you call them church shoes. And we're living in hog heaven. Again, we're circa 1965 here. Okay? So, I'm going to move the story ahead just a little bit and, and show you a picture of people in that era that I felt were extraordinary teachers and coaches. We lived in an era that I think was un, unbeknownst. You know, these are people, you know, the ones on the left are you know, the ones that I picked out. I was from the state of Michigan, so, you know, believe it or not, Johnny Orr started uh, at the University of Michigan. There's some interesting names in here. Now, if you're from Missouri, Kansas, or Illinois, you didn't make the cut here, all right? They don't have basketball. My favorite, uh, you know, the, the guy down at the bottom of this list, Jim Beheim, still active today. Six years at Syracuse. 46 years. And before that, seven as an assistant. And before that, four as a... Get that kind of uh, longevity anymore. It just doesn't happen guys, as a group, were a very people. In other words, if you watched them coach, they all were standing up, moving around, working with their, uh, working with their team. My favorite on this was uh, Judd Heathcote, not because he was from Michigan State, but because of his antics on the sideline. You gonna get? You gonna give up? My, which one I gotta give up out here? You can just use that one. Okay. Hopefully you can hear better. I love Judd Heathcote because Judd would call a timeout, and his players would go back on the floor, and immediately have a problem. And he would go just like this. He'd, he'd stand right up and he'd go, <laughs> just beating his head. And he had no hair. You know, he just wore it. He wore himself down. And it was a beautiful thing to watch Judd beat his head because his team couldn't understand and get through the process. Now, I'm going to take you back to 1965. When John Wooden coached, moved off the bench, he set 
in, on the bench with his legs crossed, like some of you are right now, and he had a program rolled up in his hand, and he sat there and he watched his team work. He didn't get off the bench. He had grilled them, and he, was con and he didn't have to coach. He didn't have to do the antics that these guys do. Didn't make them bad teachers, but he had a calmness about him that was different than any one of these characters. And I often wondered why. I got to learn why. I got to learn why uh, in uh, 1984. And this is a picture that uh, I'm quite fond of. It's uh, this picture right here. And this picture was in my office for 30 years after this particular event. This was another sales conference. I mean, I've been through enough sales conferences to shake three sticks out, and it gets old after a while because the message is the same. It wasn't that day. This guy had something to say, and for whatever reason, it was pinging between my ears. It didn't go zoom, zoom. It went ding, 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 ding. Because what he had to say, and my reference point to how he did what he did, was something I was aspiring to. He was an unbelievable gentleman, and he was willing to share his, uh, his uh, information. Now, the guy on the right, I don't know if you can don't see any changes at all. You know, there's been a little bit of a weight shift there, a little bit of a hair rearrangement. The guy's even wearing a watch, for gosh sakes, and a suit. Yeah, you know, it's days of yesteryear. But that guy, at the time, was full of pith and vinegar. Now, the reason I use that term is if Andy Hermanson can get up here and say, don't let anyone shit all over you, I can use pith and vinegar in that statement. And he got up here and said that. Oh, okay, well, I'll use, that guy's full of pith and vinegar. You see, that was an angry man there. That guy had just left the company after being there 10 years, and he was angry because he worked for a goal, and he achieved that goal only to find out that was not where he needed or wanted to go. You work 10 years and all of a sudden you find out that you're going the wrong direction. And that, that, that was a rude awakening. I was mad. And this guy said something and his demeanor and more importantly, the story associated with that pyramid of success was incorporated into a faith-based change that started there. And some of the things that I adapted from that, I maintained for a number of years. I was blessed to have a meeting with that guy and to listen to what he had to say and to build the pyramid and use the pyramid the right way. Consequently, that's why that picture set in my office for 29 years. But you see, there's a song by Jimmy Buffett. It's called Changes in Attitude, Changes in Latitude. Absolutely love the song. And that's what happened here. I, I had to make a change. Didn't want to make a change, but I didn't want to become somebody that I didn't want to be. And that's what it would have taken to be successful with First Company. So I made a 180 change and went a different direction. Took a move, left, and started over. See, I built, the concept was I was an accounting minor, so I built what's known as a T-square. You know what a T-square is? That's a, if you've got any accountants in the room, you've got assets on one side and liabilities on the other. 
my case, it was pros and cons. And boy, did the pros of a move overweigh the cons. It wasn't easy, but it was something I needed to do because I didn't want to become somebody I couldn't live with. So what did I want? And that was the difficult thing to find. And this particular presentation resonated with me to make that happen. You see, it's doing the little things over and over again correctly that make it work. And I had to build my own pyramid, my own way. The faith-based approach of John Wooden caught my eyes because there were a lot of people back in that era that weren't, that I was around that weren't utilizing that. I found out that building a relationship was more important than an award. I had enough awards and they were about me. But building a relationship lasts, awards don't. They hang on the wall, They're, everyone likes them. But relationships are what in, was important. And so I spent the next 29 years trying to build strong relationships. Somewhat successful, you know. Uh, uh, in December, I'll be married 49 years. That's a, you know, I make some good choices. Blessed to have a family that supports those activities. So I had a couple little things that I incorporated along the way. I want to leave every place better than when I found it. Not always easy to do. Sometimes you run into a real, a real bag of worms. Every day is a good day. Every day. But some days are better than others. You can find something good in every day. And I, this is one I incorporate as well. I try to have a laugh every day. Preferably on somebody else. But boy, I've got enough material to laugh at myself that I can do that. But I enjoy having a laugh on you. So if you get caught, don't feel bad. You're just one of the ones in line. Ordinary people do extraordinary things. They do. And you have to find that to get there. But ordinary people will do extraordinary things. This is the one I, I think I used it this morning. Somebody asked you, how are you doing? Great. Well, I'll get better. And that's how I feel. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a mind over mindset that helps you get where you want to go. This particular picture helped me in a lot of areas of my life, and I wanted to reinforce why. You know, the irony of being here today isn't lost on me. You see, a year ago, I couldn't put my socks on. I was in the burn unit over in Iowa City, and I could not put my socks on. I was on the back side of where the people that you know, or wait, the Stead Hospital is, uh, you know, got uh, six floors, and the burn unit's on the back side of that. Not a place you want to be in, not a place you want to visit, but it's a place of learning for this old boy. Because I, I remembered that it's the little things you do every day that count. And if you do them correctly, it'll all work out. And, you know, we're here today talking about that because things did work out. So that's my story. I hope that you get some input out of that. What we're talking about today in the pyramid is the last piece, competitive greatness. Be at your best when your best is needed. Wooden's teams were always like that. They were good. 
The other portion that he has is he has what he calls mortar. That's the thing that fills in the blocks. Ambition. Yeah, we all got some form of ambition. You know, sometimes it's not always directed properly. And this guy was sincere. Uh, he understood, and his little ditty here, sincerity may not make a friend, but it'll keep one. So, we're going to go to breakout now, and here's, our, here's the discussion questions. This one I threw in on the top. Have you put your socks on correctly today? Just a thought. Do the little things you have to do every day correctly, and all things will come together. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.